Welcome to Beyond the Document, the podcast from Formpipe, where we discuss everything that is output, document, and customer communication management. Now at Formpipe, our focus is delivering projects successfully that meet the needs of our clients. But as any reputable software vendor, we're also looking one, three, five years ahead to see what the future will bring and what needs our clients will have then. And that enables us to develop our solution to meet the market requirements. So with that in mind, it's great to be joined by my three Formpipe colleagues today, and we're going to discuss those future development and market needs. I have Steve Rhodes from the Innovations team, Soren Yort from BSG, and Mark Gett from my very own commercial team. So welcome to the podcast, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, great to be here face-to-face as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, now, Steve, I'm going to start with you. You head up the Innovations team. So it's your responsibility to be looking to the market, current trends, software providers, and also our own partners to know how Formpipe can innovate to be relevant today, but then also in the future. So can you share a little bit of the work that you and your team have been doing? Yeah, sure. So thank you, Ben. It's a real pleasure to be here. So in terms of the future developments of the uh, solution that we're going to provide and, and, the, and the changes in the market and keeping pace with that, it's kind of hard to predict at times. I mean, you know, there's no crystal ball to tell us exactly on on, on what solution we need, but we do see major developments going on with focus on hyper-personalization in the customer banking journey and also adoption of AI-driven solutions. So with hyper-personalization, the amount of data that's gathered on customers these days is huge, but it's only going to increase. Um, and we already offer ways to receive, retrieve, and store data in the LaserNet platform. So we can orchestrate data sources in LaserNet, we can hold data and, and metadata in a fully configurable archive. And conceivably, in the near future, we could use AI integrations to apply intelligent processes to that data in terms of tailoring our output to be more personal and relevant to the customer. Yeah. And just on hyper-personalization, which is still uh, a differentiator at the moment, but I do think in years to come, it's going to be the norm. People yes. are going to demand that, yeah? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And with AI generally, we're seeing it used by both partners and competitors. We need to be aware of that and make it a priority in our offering as well. I, I mean, the thing with partners as well, I saw it recently in Amsterdam. Uh, we were working with Temenos, and it was great to see some of their other ecosystem uh, partners that we know very well. And that's when the collaboration comes in as well. Do you see that within your team? Yeah, absolutely. So it's very important for us to, to reach out and, and develop relationships with, uh, with partners, tech partners and partners in, in the Temenos space as well. And uh, we're working on a range of POCs at the moment. So I'm working on one with Unicon, which is going to provide a, a system that basically harnesses their onboarding system, that identity verification, e-sign as well. Mm -hmm. So that's a big thing coming up. And we're also focusing on AI POCs as well. And we're leveraging Microsoft Azure AI Cognitive Services. We've got two uh, LaserNet configurations a fully tested rate to implement for customers, so AI translation and AI OCR as well for intelligent document analysis and text extraction. Busy time. A very busy time, yeah. <laughs> exciting time. Yes, yeah, that's true. And and Soren, your focus yeah. is more on the dynamic side, whether yes. that be FNO, BC, CE. So when you're working on such a huge platform, that brings you into play with some of the world's biggest organizations. Yeah. Yeah. So what are the key changes you're seeing in that market? So things have changed over the last couple of years, I would say. It, it seems like the projects become bigger, and because they become bigger, they also take longer time to implement, and okay. they cost more okay. money, yep. right? So now the companies come back and are asking a lot more questions than we were used to. And not that they never ask questions, but this time uh, they want any of the ISVs that they implement to do more than just one or two things. That, that, that seems to be the norm a couple of years ago. You, you found your ISVs and, and that ISV maybe fixed one or two things. Now they want maybe it to fix six or eight things. So they want to limit the number of ISVs, okay. um, have them do more for you so they don't have to deal with so many different uh, you know, ISVs, uh, different third parties, sure. right? Yeah. Because that will complicate it even further and, and, and their deadlines will you know, get pushed even further out. And, and therefore, are they also looking at the track record of that ISV to really make sure they're engaging with... Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we get a lot more of those... Um, 
uh, request for, you know, who can they call and kind of verify that, you know, whatever I tell them or whatever any of my colleagues, you know, yeah. demo, is that truly what, how it works and how successful was, you know, previous uh, implementations, right? So, so they use you to check the words of the sales guy? Uh, they, they do, right? I'm, I'm, I'm the technical guy, right? And I, I, I'm, I'm much more on the architecture and all that. So, you know, that's, that's my benefit. I don't have to talk about prices or anything like that, right? I'm more on the solution, which, you know, I love. I love coming into, you know, some of these organizations that have certain requirements and um, try and see how can we use our ISV? And if, if we don't cover it, who else would I recommend? So we, we do a lot of that as well, uh, you know, word of mouth. And, and, and luckily, we have some other ISVs that recommend us. So it, it goes both ways. And, and that's similar to what Steve alluded to there. You know, we do we do exist in an ecosystem. Yeah. We form pipe have our own ecosystem as well of partners that we trust. So yeah, that's absolutely right. And uh, and one and some of the things they also focus on more now than ever is you know where do we fit uh, uh, form pipe and the lace and the platform the connectors and all that stuff within the Microsoft product line, okay. right? Because they they already invest so heavily in Azure, uh, FNO, BCC, whatever it is, but all the Microsoft platforms. Yeah. Um, you know we also support other ERPs, but we we deal mostly with Microsoft, and um, so so they want to make sure that our um, our roadmap is actually aligned with Microsoft's roadmap. Sure. And that makes it a little bit harder for us sometimes, yeah. right? Because Microsoft changed their minds and we try to keep up. Yeah. Sometimes they don't even you know, tell all the different features that comes out. And then we realize that you know, suddenly it's released and we have to go back yeah. and, and you know, figure out how, how do we fit in there. Sure. Um, so it, it happens, right? Another thing is security. Um, everybody is, you know, hyper focused on security, right? We, we are, early. um, and, and, you know, with our certifications and Microsoft certifications, right? Together, I think that, that, that brings some calmness into, to these people. And then, of course, AI, uh, Steve was talking about it. Everybody talks AI. And of course, in the ERP world, we do the same and automation. And I know I talk about those two in, you know, over and over and over again, but that's, that's, those are the things that keeps coming up all the time. So when, when we engage, even for, for, you know, the, the work I do, I have to put, you know, a lot more effort into it. Yeah. Um, and I, I love it because we, we get a chance to do POCs. We get, you know, really in under the hood of that customer before they buy. Yeah. So it's kind of like a try and buy versus me just promising all kinds of stuff. They buy the software. It might not be able to, you know, do it. Now I, I'm able to show that what I'm saying is also accurate. Right? It's one of the best buzzers you can get in oh, work, really, right? when you find that your solution is such a good match for that client need. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, sorry, you're a Dane who lives in the States. Yes. Um, so I know your focus is more to North America, but how do you see Microsoft uh, differing globally? Do they differ what they do in different regions or, or is it just one size fits all? Ah, it's, it, it differs a little bit, but I would say, you know, in, in a general look, I've worked with Microsoft for 25 years, right? So I followed, you know, anything from Azure to, you know, all the ERP systems and, and all, you know, Office and Power Platform and all of that stuff, you know, throughout the iterations they come out. But Microsoft now has such a big portfolio and the challenge they have is they cannot necessarily be very, um, specific, uh, very, um, custom, right? They, they go with, you know, here are the 810, most commonly used uh, features, and that's what they 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 uh, kind of uh, code and 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 deliver, yeah. and then all the ISVs have to come in and cover where there are holes. Yeah. Right, we are one of them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it works. Right, yeah, so it works. It works. Yeah, yeah. But but they are now getting more and more complex. So you will see the ISVs go in and help. And like I said in the beginning, most of the times we have to cover more than just one. Uh, one little area, um, you know, it can be speed, it can be ease of use, it can be all these different things, but they want everything in one ISV portal or platform, right? And I don't blame them. No, 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 no. It's way easier to, you know, just talk to two people versus nine different ones, right? And, and the bigger ones have a, you know, it, they have needs that, that often cover at least five different ISVs. So, so we, that, that's a global thing. And, and, uh, and, but, but Microsoft, you know, um, has, has really focused on being more a generic thing and then leave it everything to the ISVs. 
And, and with a global view, we'll now bring Mark in because, Mark, you head up Formpipe in APAC, you know, which is a, a massive region. And, and us Europeans just throw that phrase away, you know, APAC. Um, we're lucky we've got existing clients in APAC, but we're still really trying to achieve market share over there. And, and I know from talking to you on a daily basis that it's slightly different in Asia Pacific than it is to Europe and North America. So can you just allude to what differences you do see in your market? Sure, and, and thanks for the opportunity, Ben. It's interesting that you refer to uh, to APAC yes. as, as, a, yeah. as a single entity. Yeah, it, yeah. It's, uh, it's it's very much not that. I mean, APAC really consists of at least four, probably half a dozen, yeah. really independent geographies or regions. I mean, Australia is as different to the Philippines as it is to the US. You know, it's a, they're completely different markets and they have completely different needs. But uh, but what we're really seeing is um, in in that's consistent across that market is. Is the rise of, of well, you can call it digital transformation. Everyone uses that term, I know, but the idea of, uh, of a purely digital bank. You know, you're seeing, particularly across ASEAN, you know, Indonesia, the Philippines, uh, Malaysia, places like that. You're seeing that um, either pure digital banks, greenfield digital banks, or traditional banks really moving into a to, to, to building out a, a digital only brand on, as a, as a, on the side of the core bank. You know, we're seeing a lot of that in the market, and I guess uh, Soren referred early on to ISV. And it's really interesting you mentioned that, Soren, because uh, you know we're seeing in the market some of the, the rise of these so-called lean cores, which yeah. are which are building out these digital banks. And and what's really interesting about those is that they are very much and I know this is not a negative term. They they do one thing. They yes. they only do the core, right? And, and I think the they rely on that ecosystem. I think you referred to the idea of an ecosystem, Soren. And I think they refer they rely on that ecosystem. Uh, to build out the br- br- the broader solution, yeah. You know, do you want do you want cards? Do you want payments? Do you want credit decisioning, or do you want reporting, for example? And and they rely on that ecosystem to to build that out. And, and it's interesting that that really brings in. And I don't know if this is true in other markets, but certainly in APAC, what I see in my market is the rising prominence of the SIs. Yes. And uh, so a lot of these these cores will rely on those SIs to to bring that ecosystem together. Yeah, and and knit it, knit it together, knit to, the technology. Yeah, to, to, yeah. to provide yeah. the plumbing and the knitting to bring yes. all that all yeah. that together. And yeah. I think yeah, we see our role in that. And we, we as, you mentioned, as you mentioned, we have our ecosystem partners. And I think come back to what what Steve mentioned earlier on is trying to sort of you know do that, build out those. Uh, POC, call them what you will, that innovation space and, and building out that capability with a host, a range of these different ISVs so that we can come to a, a bank and say, well, look, well, we've got you covered. We can work with you know, your security provider and your payments provider and your card provider you know, in conjunction with an SI uh, to build out that overall solution. And maybe you can touch on as well, what, one thing I found quite inspirational when I was working in ASEAN recently is the way that mobile banking ha- has brought banking to people who would have struggled to access a traditional banking uh, mm-hmm. kind of framework. Mm-hmm. Can you just allude to some of the countries you've seen that happening in? Yeah, you, you see a lot of that. I mean, the, the, the term that is used a lot in, in APAC is, is financial inclusion. You, you yes. Term, yeah. Financial inclusion and, and, and trying to bring in the historically underbanked Yes. Uh, into the, the digital banking world. And we've seen that particularly in places like Indonesia and the Philippines. And, you know, there's, 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 a, there's dozens, dozens of these pure digital banks cropping up. And some of them are quite small. Yeah. You know, some of them are quite regional in focus. And some of them are, you know, servicing a particular sort of rural area, potentially in somewhere like the Philippines. But they're, you know, they've come from some of that uh, sort of agricultural um, sort of support network in the past and building out a bank around that yeah. to service those needs of those people that are historically you know, didn't, didn't have access to uh, to banking services. Yeah, I find it brilliant that and, and some, my understanding is sometimes there was a mistrust of banks representing the state before and now but through digital technology they're able to just access it on a phone you know, yeah, and that's yeah, great. Yeah, and, and I think it's, it's interesting. It sounds a, bit, a little bit altruistic, I guess, but it's interesting that that uh, access to digital banking is really starting to drive a real redistribution of wealth yes, in these yeah, countries. So you are yeah. seeing, you know, the, the the wealth demographic completely changing in some of these Asian countries now in terms of who where that where that wealth resides. Yes, I mean microfinance in Africa as well is another one where it's done that. I'm just going to come back to AI. Obviously, Steve, you mentioned it earlier, and <laughs> no business can avoid it at the moment. It's impacting on all of us now. To those of us like myself who have to report a pipeline to the board, it, AI is quite disruptive. But otherwise. I just get so excited when I look at it. I think it's really positive in what it could do for society if we control it the right way. 
obviously you're more at the coal face, Steve, with what you see is doing that form pipe. But do you want to touch a little bit deeper on how you say, see AI coming into our industry? Sure, Ben. Well, the possibilities are endless. I mean, AI can fulfill pretty much any use case. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it could analyze, let's say, financial data and, and provide uh, contextual summaries in, in financial reports. You can use AI to automatically generate letters and emails in your outreach to, to customers. And not just in terms of the customer journey, but also in, in, in using our products as well. Um, we are looking at a POC right now that harnesses AI semantic search on, a, on, the, uh, on the archive. So essentially, with a free text search, you could have an AI system which understands the context of the requests when searching on the archive data. So the possibilities are, are endless in, in every aspect of the business. And, I, and I've seen the demo of that, and it's really, really exciting where very that might exciting, go. Very exciting, very yeah, exciting. It's interesting. I was at a conference just last week where we had a, a couple of guys talking about AI, and I think the challenge in AI is, as you, Steve, as you mentioned, you, it can do limitless things. I think the challenge is that in, in AI in a, in a business context is understanding where to apply it judiciously so that it makes yes. the most impact. Yep. I think everyone talks about AI, but been trying to define where AI makes the most sense for the for the business and trying to put it, bring it in that context is really important. Uh, and we're still waiting for the regulators to feed it into how they're going to govern it within our, all our different industries. I, I'm amazed it's nearly the end of 2024 and we still haven't really got any guidance from those regulators. And I would say in the ERP world, right, I mean, we, we try to take AI and place it inside, you know, some of our products to actually make the use or the use cases easier to achieve using the AI built or built in AI, right? Yeah, and we, sure. You know, and, and we we don't come up with you know necessarily all the uh, uh, all the mechanics behind it. Uh, we use Microsoft, like like Steve was talking about. Even in ERP, we use the same, right? Uh, but but it's amazing how how you can make your tools even easier and faster mm -hmm. to use. Uh, helping, like you said, you know, wh where are the use cases, right? And, and we try in the ERP uh, world to kind of guide people and say, we have created these use cases, you know, this is just a start, yes. right? Yeah. And then we can build on it. Yeah. But at least we have, you know, started you on that journey or that, that learning uh, journey on, you know, where can I use AI? Right? And that brings it perfectly into my next question, because all of technology is brilliant, but ultimately it's end user behavior that dictates what we do. Yeah. Okay. And I, I know in the banking world, we've seen that massive change to people wanting to bank on their phone via an app, you know, whether that be retail banking or wealth banking. Um, so where do we see those changes going next? Has anybody got any guesses as to what might be the biggest next development in user behavior? I could uh, I can jump in very quickly, Ben. For again, I think one of the things that I'm seeing, uh, and this is just sort of looking at the marketplace and seeing you know, some of the analysts, what the analysts are saying. Yeah, you know, this idea of self-service banking. I mean, people, particularly in wealth. I mean, it's true in, in, in normal retail banking too, but particularly in wealth. You know, the idea of having a a wealth manager and a, and a banker. Uh, is, is particularly for the, the younger generation, you know, Gen, Gen Z and, and and younger, is that. People are saying, "Well, I don't want a, ma a banker. I want to do it myself. You know, I've, got, I've got my phone. I've got all the tools I need. I want to manage my own portfolio and make my own decisions." And I think that's where, from a technology perspective, the ability to, to do that on your phone or on the on the PC is, is I think, a, a trend we're seeing that that, that self service banking is becoming more and more prevalent. Yeah, and, and people trust their own judgment. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that's great because we've got at our fingertips is so much information now or or aids like AI. So you should be able to go and get educated and make your own decision in that way. Brilliant. Okay. And innovation is great. It's fantastic. Steve, your team, the work that they're doing is great, but let's not lose sight that it's still great to be in person and meeting human beings. And we're lucky. Yeah, <laughs> we're lucky to be all together this week. So yeah. just to sign off, what are you looking to get out of our time together in Brighton? A lot of things, right? But again, get that face-to-face, -face, right? I yeah. think, you know, here, in, you know, on, in the ERP world and even in the banking in the US and you know, the Americas, right, which I, I cover with together with my colleague, Roberto, um, we sit at home, right? Yes. And it, 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 you know, I sit in Indiana, uh, you know, he sits in Ohio, somebody sits in Chicago, right? And, and we don't see each other every day. Yeah. So it's just, you know, getting together and, and kind of talk about, you know, I, I heard for the first time when, when you guys are doing an APAC, that's, that's the first time I hear it, right? And sure, you can always set up, you know, teams and all that, but it gets too structured. These un, unstructured conversations are, are way more valuable, yeah. right? And I think 
you know, customers, you know, even though they have all that amazing tools, there is something still valuable with the, with the face to face, yeah, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I think, you know, for me, it's, uh, you know, I come from a somewhat unique perspective, I guess, in Form Pipe that I'm sitting in, in Sydney, Australia. It's yeah, just, yeah. Uh, 20, 25, <laughs> way away. 25 hours and, you know, three, four, four time zones away from everybody else. So, so I think, you know, for me, you know, being here in, in, in Brighton this week is, uh, you know, and being part of the, the Form Pipe team, just is really, I, I think that people refer to the, the, the water cooler conversation. I think, yeah, yeah, sort of sort of, I think having that ability to just have those off-the-cuff conversations and you you learn so much more from those than perhaps you do from a more structured oh. uh, team's call or whatever. I think yeah. for me, just being uh, sort of seeing the team, being part of the team, it gives you that sort of you know, sense of being a, you know, you, you can't get a sense of isolation, I guess, being so far away that you, you are part of a broader team. Yeah, absolutely. And pretty excited as well because tomorrow the innovation team is going to be giving a presentation on AI. We're going to be sharing a range of proof of concepts and we'd love to generate discussion and get feedback really from the rest of Formpipe on how exactly we'd like to proceed with this. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, I'm really excited about that because it's how do we take these theoretical things and put them into practice and then actually take them to market as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, gents, it's nearly time for our tea. So I'm going to thank you uh, for being here today and, and sign off the podcast. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Document. Thank you again to Steve, Mark and Soren for joining me today. I'm Ben Saxton. Catch you next time on Beyond the Document.